The true story of World War II's greatest escape began here, 50 years ago, in a desolate forest near what is now Zagan, Poland, about 90 miles southeast of Berlin. It was here that the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, built the prisoner of war camp known as Stalag Luft III. There isn't much left of the camp today, but during the war it housed more than 10,000 POWs, one of whom was Paul Brickhill. While he never escaped, he did survive to tell the true story of those who did. There will be no escapes from this camp. Colonel von Luger, it is the sworn duty of all officers to try to escape. If they can't, it is their sworn duty to cause the enemy to use an inordinate number of troops to guard them, and their sworn duty to harass the enemy to the best of their ability. Paul Brickhill's tale of these remarkable men and their indomitable spirit was published as The Great Escape in 1950. Thirteen years later, it was brought to the screen and became the blockbuster hit of that summer. Now, 30 years after it premiered, The Great Escape is still one of the most popular films of all time. Gentlemen, no doubt you've heard the uh, immortal words of our new commandant. Devote your energies to things other than escape and uh, sit out the war as comfortably as possible. Ha! Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. It was the filmmaker's intent to remain true to the original book, yet create characters that were composites of the real American and British prisoners. The organizer of the escape, Big X, was patterned after Roger Bushell. Danny the Tunnel King was really Wally Floody. Blythe the Forger was Tim Whalen, and Eric Ashley Pitt was Royal Navy Flying Officer Peter Fanshaw. I remember feeling it was a great responsibility to play a man who existed, who really, you know, you, you fictionalize someone's real life, you have a very definite responsibility. But the, the, the part, I was assured, was absolutely true to what Ashley Pitt was like and what he did. Tally on. Creating characters that were true to history was one thing, but how could such an unbelievable caper be filmed in a believable manner? That was the challenge that faced director John Sturgis when he tackled The Great Escape. How many are you taking out? 250. 250? Yeah. You're crazy. You ought to be locked up. You too. 250 guys just walking down the road just like that. Sturgis died in 1992, but his passion to make this epic war drama lives on as one of the great stories of film history. Even though Sturgis had become a successful director with such films as Bad Day at Black Rock and Gunfight at the OK Corral, he could not convince Hollywood to make The Great Escape. I tried to do this for about eight years before I became an independent, and everybody just smiled and changed the subject. With the Marish Brothers and with United Artists, I'd just come off a successful picture, The Magnificent Seven. And I think if I wanted to direct the telephone book, they'd have probably at least given me a hearing. And it was United Artists and the Marish Brothers that gave him the go-ahead and $4 million to make his picture. In much the same way that he did with The Magnificent Seven, Sturgis cast another memorable ensemble. He had great faith in the actor, and uh, he would storyboard everything. He never talked to him about character, didn't talk to him about anything. What was on the script was what you shot, what was on the storyboard was the way it was shot. And uh, that was it. Another actor from The Magnificent Seven who made an impression on Sturgis was Charles Bronson. He joined The Great Escape as Danny the Tunnel King. Donald Pleasance, who played the mild-mannered forger, was particularly qualified for his role. Well, I, I was in, the, I, I was flying in Lanc Lancaster bombers, and I was shot down on a daylight raid over France. And eventually, I was marched up to Germany with the retreating German army, and uh, ended up in, in a camp called Stalag Luft I. To begin with, I, I used to make suggestions. 
but uh, they didn't go down very well with uh, John Sturgis and the American crew, who believed that all people in a prison camp, especially if they were Americans, were enormously brave and would never say rude things to a German who was armed to the teeth. But, <laughs> so I made a few remarks and then I shut up. <laughs> James Garner also used his own war experience to develop his character. I was a scrounger for a whole company uh, in Yongdong Po, Korea. And so I, I knew a little bit about the hustle and, and whatever that went on. So uh, I knew basically what I thought Henley would be like. And of course, I did that. What's holding us up now is the new form of this travel permit. We've no idea what they look like. Uh, here's one. And a military identity card. You get 10 out of 10 for this, old boy. Thank you, sir. Take good care of that. Uh, where did you get this? You... It's on loan. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first scene we did was the one uh, where James Garner, Steve McQueen, and I have uh, made this booze and uh, are drinking. And that was... Uh, a difficult scene. It doesn't. It doesn't seem so in the movie, but it was difficult because we each tried to find a different reaction to this raw alcohol that we drank. It was a matter of kind of experimentation and, and doing it over and over again until John was satisfied. Wow. Wow. <coughs> wow. John gave you a great deal of freedom uh, to try things. And then he, but he had a very clear sense of when he liked something. I was a British actor, born in Scotland, very green in many ways, not much traveled. And here I am dumped into a huge American production, building the entire set at uh, Geiselgasteig and down in, in, in Germany, and working with people like Steve McQueen and, and James Garner. I mean, it was just. It was a, a sort of dream come true. Steve was perfect. Steve was the fellow that represented everything about the indomitable spirit that these fellows had. They were cocky. They were actually afraid. They were actually brought down physically and mentally by the whole thing. They never showed it. Are all American officers so ill-mannered? Mm, about 99%. In order to be as authentic as possible, Sturgis and his assistant, Robert Raillier, tried to visit the original camp in Zagon, Poland. But in 1962, it was behind the Iron Curtain. They actually considered making the film in the mountains above Los Angeles. So we both wanted to make the picture here. So we said, OK, we can make the picture here. What we'll do is we'll find a place with some pine trees, and we'll just make the whole thing here. So I went up between Idlewild and Palm Springs, and I found six pine trees. They weren't too full, but, you know, there were six of them. I said, it looks like the Black Forest to me. I went to Germany, touring around, and then I had to call John and say, you know, this is going to be a big surprise to you. But unfortunately, you know, Germany looks like it looks like Germany. Uh, it would really work here. This eventually became the home of the Great Escape, Munich's Bavaria Studios in the suburb of Geiselgastag. Once we decided to build a camp in the studio, we had to prepare the grounds. They had a wonderful spot, uh, a forest, behind the studio, which they cleared out. And uh, as you will see in the, in the drawing, uh, we decided to build a camp there. Using historical photographs of the real camp, Carrere created detailed sketches, blueprints, and models that helped him engineer the legendary Stalag Luft III on the back lot of the studio. We brought the Minister of the Interior out, very elderly gentleman. We put him on the Chapman crane. We brought him up in the air. We let him look down and said, you know, uh, Mr. Minister, what we'd like to do is tear out 400 trees. Now, explaining our reason, we'll now tell you what we would do in return. We'll plant two for one. We want the prison camp to look like it's enclosed by another prison, the trees. And he sat on the Chapman crane, and he looked through the lens, and he said, I understand. And we started bulldozing trees. 
We were very careful to be authentic about everything in the picture. The uniforms are all the way they were. The camp is the way it was. The wire is the way it was. The strip of death. And inside all that were the various huts the men lived in and, of course, the goon towers where they watched every move people made. This is almost a dead ringer for the real camp at Sagan. I, I was amazed. I thought it, uh, it was an amazing set. It was an exact replica of the camp I was in, just about. I mean, uh, except where it was needed to be different for uh, cinematic reasons. It was a, an exact reproduction of a prisoner of war camp, and just as frightening. The man John Sturgis hired to keep an eye on the reality was C. Wallace Floody. He was one of the key conspirators in the planning and preparations for the real escape and was nicknamed the Tunnel King. He spent 12 weeks in Germany helping everyone involved with the production of the great escape get it right. His schedule was full 12 hours a day. For example, the art director would take him and put him in the tunnel set and and he'd roll around and he would say, it's a little too big because I remember I wasn't quite that comfortable. We were about two days away from starting to shoot and Wally and I had dinner together and he said, let me tell you something, everybody's doing it right. And I said, what makes you think that? And he said, I had terrible nightmares last night. So I know that we're getting back to reality. The tunnels were wonderful because it was a big stage at Geiselgastei. They, they ran the entire length of the studio from, and just with one side cut open. So it was a silly looking set. I mean, it was mostly construction that you saw, but when you got close, you just saw into the tunnel with one side. And that meant that people could go flying through the tunnel on this, the, the little trolley cars, with the camera hurtling alongside it. What? Hard! Sturgis may have been able to build a complete replica of Stalag Luft III and find a dream cast. What is it? Well, they're celebrating the revolution. It's the 4th of July. But major problems with the script almost sank the project before it started. With six writers and 11 versions of the script, Sturgis found himself improvising on a daily basis. We never really did get a complete screenplay. It just couldn't be done. It had to be, I won't say invented, but it had to be put down as it went along. And a great part of it was done as we shot. I'm not proposing that's a good way to make a movie, but it was the right way to make this one. Shooting without a finished script was particularly difficult for Steve McQueen, who was not satisfied with his part or his director's promises. We got to Germany and they started filming and Steve's part still was not defined. I mean, they really didn't know. They got a little bit here and a little bit there, but nothing to say that's a Steve McQueen movie sort of thing, you know? And then when Jimmy Garner started filming, and he had his white T-shirt and his cap, and uh, Steve saw that, he said, he said, uh, this, I'm not going to work unless they fix my part. John Sturgis, perhaps rather foolishly, showed a a rough cut of the first six weeks of shooting and Steve McQueen walked out and uh, insisted that his part be rewritten. So this was all new to me. I hadn't realized things like this go on in Hollywood. Being a little obedient English actor from the theater mostly. And um, so they sent for, I think two or three script writers flew out from Hollywood and we stopped shooting on, on Steve and uh, we, somebody would come through a door and we would stop shooting the scene because we didn't know who was going to come through the door because these guys typing away on the typewriters all day long we thought it's obviously going to be not C. McQueen but some totally different well after six weeks we recommenced shooting on Steve McQueen and I, who came through the door but Steve McQueen <laughs> saying more or less the same lines Coburn and I and Steve went over to my place in, in Munich, and we sat out, and we said, well, what's your problem, Steve, you know? And it turns out, after a few hours of, of talking about it, Steve wanted to be the hero, but he didn't want to do anything heroic. And there were a lot of things that Steve, you know, was going to do in the picture to make him a hero, and he didn't like to do those things. He thought they were corny, so what happened was, 
We told him he was a hero. If you remember, he leaves, he escapes by himself. They capture him, but he brings back all the information that we need for the escape. And so he becomes a hero in that, in that respect. But that's really what he wanted, and it was really strange. We, we talked him into it, Colbert and I, pretty much. Nothing makes Steve McQueen more of a hero than that famous motorcycle chase. McQueen and motorcycle dealer Bud Eakins were already racing buddies when McQueen was cast in The Great Escape. One day he come in and says, um, I'd like to go to Germany with me and double me riding a motorcycle. I says, yeah, sure, Steve. Didn't think anything of it. And he says, uh, calls up one day and says, uh, you got a suit? And I says, yeah. And he says, well, get it on. We're going to meet the director. So we go down and we meet John Sturgis and uh, met John. And John looks at me and nods his head, yeah. Which means I would be a good double for him. And uh, it happened. In two weeks, we were in Munich. Eakins and McQueen eventually worked out the details of the chase, which was not in the original script. It began at the checkpoint when Hiltz is challenged by a German officer. Hey, hey, hey. Steve's ability on a motorcycle was enormous. If you look real closely, a lot of the Germans chasing Steve are Steve. We would just do the old Western trick of having Steve take over the hill, jump the hill, run down the gully, and then he'd run and change uniforms and put on goggles and a helmet, and he would be the German chasing him. He was a good rider. He was quick, but he'd have to go do his movies. Uh and not race for three to six months, but uh, he'd always take a bike with him, but he was quick, you know? For many years, audiences assumed that Steve McQueen actually jumped the wire on the Swiss border, but insurance regulations forced him to let Bud Eakins be the daredevil. Sturgis asked me one day, he says, uh, if we had a fence, could you jump over it? And I says, well, yeah. And uh, he says, well, how high of a fence could you jump over? And we got it where the wheels of the motorcycle were 12 feet off the ground and jumping about 65 feet. And so come time to do it, and the adrenaline got going, and I hit it about 60 miles an hour. And it really went up in the air, and I can remember being in the air, and there was dead silence. I mean, there was a few hundred people there, you know, all the extras and everything. And when I was in the air, it seemed like I was up there forever, and it was dead silence, nothing, just going through the wind, and boom, it hit the ground, and it shook, and I almost fell off. Editor Ferris Webster was nominated for an Oscar for cutting sequences like this, in which it appears that McQueen is making the jump. That's McQueen. That's Eakins. That's McQueen. And finally, that's Eakins. In order to make all that barbed wire, when anybody was sitting in the camp with time to spare, we were handed this rubber, like string, and you wrapped a little piece of rubber around it every six inches to make the barbs. That entire fence was made by the entire company in their spare time. Trains also played an important part in the Great Escape, as they did in the real event. The Zagan train station was less than a mile from the camp. That station was duplicated a short distance from the Bavaria studios, and German railroad officials provided the train. I said, you know, we'd like to get on a train and run. They said, okay, well, what train would you like? And I said, well, you know, if we had our druthers, we'd like to run between Munich and uh, Stuttgart, which is their busiest line. I said, that's okay. So we bought two cars and then one flat car to put the Chapman crane on. We were filming on that train with existing trains going down that line. And we had sometimes, we cleared by a minute, you know, uh, and get on a siding by the time that other one's coming through. And it, it, we were sitting on tenter hooks a few times. Gosh, I hope we get off on the siding before that train comes through. It was a little scary. 
So we have the Chapman Crane way out for Garner and Pleasance to jump. And the guy steps up to me and says, uh, if I was you, I would pull that thing back in because we're about to come to a concrete pole in about 40 seconds. I said, bring the arm in. So we bring the arm back in with three guys on it and this thing whisks by. It's one of those great moments of your life when you, you A, you, you're up for the part, you get the part, you do the part, you wait while they put it together and you get to go into a cinema and sit down and watch it. And the lights go down. And what is so wonderful about this film is uh, the music. I mean, the Elmer Bernstein's music. Just away you go, and the trucks run. I mean, it was just, oh, wow. I mean, it doesn't often happen like that. The Great Escape is more than one of history's great war dramas. For many of the generation born after 1945, this was the film that introduced them to World War II. It not only entertained on a spectacular level, but it also explained how our side eventually won the war. You know, why, why The Great Escape was The Great Escape was because it was uh, D-Day, and they were trying to divert as many troops away from D-Day from the uh, as they could. We, and it, it really worked. They diverted over a million troops away from uh, that landing. Well, that was the whole goal. It, it, it took people away from what they were doing to hunt down 77 people or whatever it was that got out of there. Uh, and of course, uh, the guys in the camp felt that was their duty to escape because it did take, you know, the German troops and people away from what they should be doing to chase a bunch of prisoners, you know. And they got a little hot about it, too, uh, by the, what, 50 guys who were killed. Addison, John, Allardale, Peter, Bancroft, Edward, Bartlett, Roger, Cavendish, Dennis. Today, Zagan remains essentially as it was 50 years ago, and the growing forest continues to obscure the outline of the original Stalag Luft III. But time does not obscure the truth. In the Royal Air Force Cemetery, there are three stone tablets inscribed with 50 names and ranks. These are the Allied prisoners who were murdered by the Nazi secret police in 1944. Real men, not actors. It reminds us that the film depicted actual events, not just an image preserved on film. But thanks to the passion of John Sturgis, the deeds of these men will live on to inspire new generations with the never say never motto of the X organization. They showed us how courage, raw ingenuity, and action can alter the course of human events, even against impossible odds. That is the true legacy of the great escape.